friends. Today is up to chapter seven, and we did verse um, we did verse uh, three yesterday. So up to chapter seven, verse four. After he said, Hashem says he'll harden Pharaoh's heart. Chapter seven, verse four. Pharaoh will not listen to you. I will place my hand on Egypt, and I'll take out my hosts, my family, the children of Israel, from the land of Egypt, with great, uh, with great um, uh, shvatim, is judgments. This is like a shofet, great judgments upon the Egyptians. Rashi says, it yadi. Yad mamash, a literal hand, la'akotbam, to strike them. Meaning to say, it can't be that this is an actual hand. So it just means, uh, I don't know what Rashi is trying to say, but he's saying yad mamash, a hand literally to strike them. Uh, so they, the commentary here says, usually it means a blow, but. I don't know, unless Rashi is saying, he wants us to think here that God has an actual hand, which if Rashi is saying that, it's very, very hard for me to understand. Okay, verse five. The Egyptians will know that I am God. When I stretch forth my hand over Egypt, and I will lead the children of Israel from amongst them. Okay, no rush on that. Moses Moshe and Aaron kasher tziva Hashem otam kenasu. Moses and Aaron did just like God commanded them, so they did. Moshe ben shmonim shana. Moses was eighty years old. The Aaron ben shalosh shmonim shana, and Aaron was eighty-three. B'dabram el paro when he spoke, when they spoke to Pharaoh. So Moses was eighty, and Aaron was eighty-three. Vayomer Hashem Moshe. Moses God said to Moshe, and Aaron saying. When Paro will speak to you, saying, Give us a sign, give us a miracle or, or indication. Then say to Aaron, Take your staff and cast it down before Paro. Let it be a tanin. So, okay, so let's see what this Rashi says. Very important Rashi. He says, when Pharaoh will ask you for a sign, Ot, a wonder, a sign, to let you know that there is Tzorech. Um, technically, Tzorech means a need. Someone will amend the text to say that there's a power. Um, okay. And Rashi says, what is Tanin? Nachash. Rashi says it means a nachash. But elsewhere in Tanakh, Rashi says in, the, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, he says that it's a gigantic sea creature. And here Rashi says it means a snake. So that's why most people understand this as a, that he cast down a staff and it became a stink. Other commentaries say it's a crocodile. They, the Nile River has crocodiles, so we would. Uh, so some say it's a crocodile, but you could imagine a snake because they used to do a lot of tricks with sticks and thinking the sticks were snakes and use all sorts of things. You could keep this, you know, a snake charmer. So a snake sounds. I mean, it's very hard to imagine that you throw down a stick and it turns into a crocodile. But you could tell you could throw down a stick and it becomes a snake. But whatever it is. The reason why I'm saying, well, that other people did it is because Paro is going to say that his, his magicians can do that also. So if his magicians could do it, it's not a miracle. So there has to be some magical exp explanation. And that's why Moshe and Aaron came to Paro and they did this just like God commanded them. Aaron sent forth his staff before Paro, so Moshe and Aaron came, and Aaron was the one who stuck, stuck forth his um, stick before Paro and his servants, and it was a tanin, became this tanin. Rashi says the snake. 
Because if it's a snake, why doesn't it use the word nachash? We know that the Torah has a nachash, right? The Torah has a, the Torah knows the word for snake. Why is it not using the word for snake here? Well, that's the theory. That's the theory. But why would then why would Rashi call it a snake? No, he explains the word tanin earlier as being this gigantic sea creature. So he could have explained it like that. So why is he calling, why is Rashi changing the word here? I think it's because Rashi can't imagine how the Egyptian um, sorcerers made this. I know that's just my theory. So what happens now? Paro called his own advisors, his own wise men, his own magicians. And the, the sorcerers of Egypt did the same thing with their charms. Bilatein, Rashi says, with their incantations. Rashi says, this word, there's no similar word to it in the Torah. Wow. Rashi says, we have to compare it to the word the sword, the blade of the sword, or the incantation of the revolving sword. This was at the entrance to the Garden of Eden. So right now we're seeing two references to the Garden of Eden. It means the sword revolves through an incantation. So suddenly we're seeing two references here to the Garden of Eden. First, that the snakes that they're producing, and second, they're doing it through this incantation, which is also at the Garden of Eden. So I don't know what the significance of it is, but I put it out there. But now look what happens. Everybody throws down their staff. They became these serpents. Aaron's staff swallowed their staff. So this reminds us, by the way, when we read this, the whole irony here is, how can you read this without thinking of the last animal to swallow another animal, which were the skinny cows in Egypt swallowing the fat cows. And all of a sudden here, we're having a similar scene that Aaron's staff is swallowing and Aaron's staff is a snake and all the Egyptians put down multiple snakes and Aaron's snake, which is presumably smaller, swallows up all the larger snakes. Oh, Rashi tells us something very interesting. Rashi says, oh, because the fact is the verse states, it doesn't say that Aaron's snake swallowed up their snake. It says Aaron's staff swallowed up their snake. So Rashi is saying that Aaron threw down his stick. It became a snake. Then he picked it up again and it became a staff again. And then they threw down their sticks and it became snakes. And then Aaron's staff, while it was a staff, swallowed them all. So it swallows. So that's a really big miracle. It swallows them all while it's a stick, not while it's a snake. I never thought about that. So that's very interesting. Okay. Okay, next verse. So Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He didn't listen to them just like God had spoken. God says to Moshe, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to send out the people. She says, Kaved means targmo yakir, heavy. Neshu shem devar, it's an adjective. Ki kaved mimcha devar, the matter is too heavy for you. Okay, next verse. Leich al paro, go to Pharaoh. He says, go to Pharaoh, baboker, go to Pharaoh in the morning. Hine yotzei amayma. Go to Pharaoh in the morning when the water comes out. He goes out to the water and he stands, you shall stand out opposite to greet him 
by the banks of the river. And the snake, which the staff, which is turned into a snake, you shall take in your hands. So this is significant. Now, Steve, you say, why did he translate it as a snake? Because here the staff is told that it turns into a nachash, which is definitely a snake. But this could be referring back to Moses' staff, which, which did turn into a snake when it was when he was standing there at Sinai and God appeared to him. Let's see what Rashi does with this. We're in chapter 7, verse 15. Oh, Desmond. Oh, we have a chumash here, Desmond, but you could take that. No, no, no. You are stand, go to the left, to the left. Oh, you want a sitter? Okay, fine. Yeah, chapter 7, verse 15. He goes out to the water in a kavav. Why does he go to the river? He's going to uh, he's going out to the river to 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 relieve himself. So Koshaya Osa Atzmo Pharaoh made himself like he was a god. And he says, "Listen, I don't need to go to the bathroom ever." And he, then he would get up early and go to the Nile. So nobody would see him and go to the bathroom there. So that's because it says he goes out to the water. It's a regular activity. He does again and again and again. So that's what he's saying. What are you saying, Steve? Yeah, he goes out to the Nile River when nobody's there. He goes really early. All right. I get that part. It comes back to what I told the other day, it's a woman. And so therefore, he, that person didn't want anybody seeing them go to the bathroom. Right. right. It could be this is the first transgender person in, in history, the uh, Pharaoh. No. Well, she was trying to ident this, identify as a man, even though she was a woman. Yeah. Yeah, so she was identifying as a man. Amazing. This is, this is documented. This is amazing. Steve is saying to us, for those of you who can't hear, Steve has researched this, and his research indicates that there was a pharaoh who was actually a woman around this time and was presenting herself as a man. That's why she was trying to kill the male children. And so the, this Rashi would support that, that she wanted to go to the bathroom where nobody could see her, because she went to the bathroom differently. Also, she had to bathe. She was different, so she was hiding her identity. Um, this is, makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying the world that that's a very beautiful. <laughs> they say there's a rule, you know, when you go to swim team. Everybody pees in the pool. Everybody. If they deny it, no, he Okay. On that note, Ramarta Ewav, and you shall say to him, Hashem, okay, I have rim, Shalchani Ewav. You say to him, Hashem, the God of the Hebrews, Send me to you, way more. Send forth my people so they can worship me in the wilderness. We're in chapter 7, verse 16. You haven't listened until now. Rashi says, Adko, this means Adhena until here. The Midrash means until you hear from me the, the plague of affliction. The plague of the firstborn. Because what's the word ko? Because the word, the plague of the affliction of the firstborn begins with the word ko. Ko amar Hashem So, so until you hear the word ko, you're going to be in a, you're going to be, um, you're going to be um, in that manner. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. Okay. So then the verse says, okay, so now the verse states. A Barbanel, this is very, very modern version. A Barbanel? What does he say? He's a great diplomat. Yeah, what does he say? He says that the custom back then of the kings was that they would go out there and do sports in the water, like like polo or something, to build up your appetite for breakfast. That they would that they would play. Yeah, yeah, they would do sports. Like, like, like people work out in the morning here also, or they they chow down. Very modern version. 
That's very, very interesting. Ramana well, always is the most modern. He, uh, uh, yeah, they need to exercise. Okay, very nice, very nice. Okay, so the verse states, Verse 17. Come on. This is a word actually played ball. Wow, he knows that. It's, you know, <laughs> it's not, it's so not nice, nice. He was a very bright man. Okay. Come, beautiful. Come, our Hashem. So, verse 17. This is what Hashem says. Bezos te da, with this you shall know, ki ani Hashem, that I am God. Hine anochi ma kebe ma te asher biyadi. Behold, I will strike the staff in my hand, awamayim. On the water are sure by or Venapuadam. Moses says, This is how you know that I that Hashem that I am God, because I'm gonna strike with my staff and it's in my hand the water that's on the river and it will turn to blood. Rashi says, Why is this the case? It will turn to blood. Rashi says, why basically Rashi is saying, why is the first plague against the Nile? Because there was no river, there was no rain in Egypt. The Nilus Oel Mashkat cards, the Nile ascended and irrigated the whole land. Umitrim of Dim were Nilus, and the Egyptians worshipped the Nilus. Therefore, he strikes, Hashem strikes the one they fear, then it strikes them. So we see two reasons, two reasons why. Hashem started, according to Rashi, two reasons why the first plague is in Nile. One, one, because it was their economy. It, it was essential, it literally was their life. There was no rain. If it affects the Nile, you need your, the economy is the engine of society. If you affect the economy, you've affected, you've destroyed the society. Would you agree with that, Desmond? Absolutely. As the preeminent economist in our country, would you agree with that? So basically, you destroy the Nile, you've got them. Yep. It's like it's like today. If you but shut also, yeah. you shut down the stock market, uh, we'll be in big trouble. You shut down the Jordan River. You oh. shut down a lot of. Them. Yeah, shut down to this day. Yep. To this day, if it didn't rain in this country for for two weeks, we'd probably be in huge trouble. Yep. So so so. Okay, and the second reason is because they worship the Nile. So Rashi says two reasons why the why the not the river turning to blood was the first plague. But then Rashi says Daga Asher by or and the fish that was in the sea that was in the river Tamut, it will they will the fish will die. Uvaish Hai or and the river will become disgusting. And the Egyptians will refuse to drink the water from the river. Now, all of a sudden, we're seeing something else. Rashi says, they're going, to, they're going to become tired from looking for a remedy for the water. Meaning to say, they're not becoming weary from drinking the water. They're going to give up finding a solution to the water. So what's going on here is that Moshe is warning Pharaoh, everybody is going to give up on the water. The fish, when we think the plague was not just the, the water turning red, the plague is everything, all the life forces in the water turn to become dead. And also we can say, by the way, uh, it's the obvious symbolism is, this is not Rashi, but we, we just, Assume it's so obvious, Rashi doesn't need to say it, that the river which which Pharaoh had said all the babies were going to, all the baby boys were being thrown into it and drowned, that river is, it's like the blood coming forth from it. The symbolism, the river that they made bloody is now completely bloody. So what's the next verse? Vayomer, verse 19. Vayomer Hashem Moshe. And Hashem said to Moshe, Emor al Aaron, say to Aaron, Kach matcha, take your staff, Unateyatcha al Meme Mishraim, stretch forth your hand on the waters of Egypt, on their Rotam Val Yoram, on their rivers and their swamps, Val Agameim, on their rivers, on their canals, on their swamps, Val Komik Femeim, and all their 
bodies of water are viewed dam. Let it become blood. There will be blood in the whole land of Egypt by Tzimu Vavanim, the wood and the stones. So how is there going to be blood in the wood and the stones? Let's see what Rashi is going to say about that. We'll see what he says, but first we go slowly. Now, the first question is, Moshe had said, I'm going to take my staff and stick it on the water. And here, Hashem says to Moshe, tell Aaron to take his staff. So Rashi is going to address why the switch from Moses to Aaron. So Rashi says, Lafisha, now this is one of my favorite Rashi's in the whole Bible. Lafisha, he gain hay or al Moshe, because the river had protected Moses. When Moses was cast into the river, Ah, so verse 19, it tells us about such an important concept. The concept of that the reason why, the reason why Moshe Rabbeinu did not strike the river, Rashi tells us, is because, is because, is because this river had saved his life. This river when Moses was cast into the river, the river saved his life. And so therefore, since this river saved his life, therefore, it was not going to be struck by him, neither at the plague of blood, nor the frags, nor the frogs, but it was done through the hands of Aaron. And this is the fundamental idea that you can never harm anything that has ever been beneficial. This is such an important religious concept. At the beginning of the Exodus story, we're being taught the concept of gratitude. That Moshe Rabbeinu, who is he expressing gratitude to? To a river. And this is really the, the teaching of the Talmud, the teaching of Rashi, that fundamentally we cannot begin, because what was the big sin of the Egyptians? The big sin of the Egyptians was the sin of not having gratitude to Joseph. Well, that the new Pharaoh arose who did not remember Joseph and he forgot him. He did not remember him. So we, when we come to our redemption, there cannot be an ounce of lack of gratitude. And in fact, the, the, later on, we're, we're told in the Torah to express our gratitude towards the Egyptians as well, for at least hosting us to a limited degree. So Rash is telling us that this is why Aaron hits the river and not Moses, because Moses has to express gratitude. But I have a question on that. Why doesn't Aaron express gratitude for the fact that Moshe was saved? So why doesn't Aaron express gratitude for the fact that Moshe was saved? Because, because Aaron, Aaron I, pre, I presume here, said that needs water to purify himself to do that moment. So to him, water is, 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 is a friend. Yeah, well, yeah, so I was very nice, very nice. I was, I was thinking something else. Aaron can't express the gratitude on behalf of Moshe. The gratitude is not something like, Meyer, if, I, if you do, you do favors for me all the time. When you do a favor for me, I can't say, I can't say to my son, go over to Meyer and say thank you for me. No, that's not appropriate. You can't, express, you can't have an agent express gratitude for you. You have to express the gratitude yourself. So this was a responsibility upon Moshe. That's why when we say the Modin prayer, when the Chazin can fulfill the, the service on behalf of everyone, when the chazan does the repetition, if you don't know how to say the words properly, the chazan can recite a few, except for the, thing, the prayer of gratitude. The prayer of gratitude, we have to say ourselves. That cannot be done through an agent. You can't say, that's like the ultimate not gratitude to say that you don't even have the, the, the time to say thank you for what you did. So, so, so now the next one he says, and, he, and it was on their rivers, Haim the Haros, were you saying something, Judah? Well, how about if you, for Kibbutz Ava Aim, someone, um, you know, gave your father a job or saved him or whatever, you can say thank you for um, my father was there, but then my father, for Kibbutz Ava Aim? You could, you could certainly say thank you, but your father has the responsibility to express gratitude if somebody helped them. You can you you can express gratitude on your own for the actions that were done for you for that you benefited from um, residually I guess I don't know what the word is 
but you because when you're when you, the fact that this person took care of your father that was a benefit to you so you could express your gratitude but your father is not absolved you, you know so to speak in this in this case your father would not be absolved by your saying thank you your father would still have an obligation to express their gratitude What's the father? Right. Oh, okay. well, you're doing it oh. and that's different if the father can't do it the father can't do it but you but can't express gratitude for somebody on in, when they're not capable of it for sure. Well, I would say like this. If your father is not well, they can't say anything. So they're not obligated to. But you're expressing gratitude on their behalf is not really on their behalf. It's on your behalf that you feel appreciative of what they did for your father or what you did for your friend or this. Like, let's say that person takes care of your father. You have an obligation to take care of your father. So you're expressing gratitude for what they're doing for you. But you can't express gratitude on me on behalf of somebody else because that's their job but you have your own gratitude that you're expressing i mean it's also like the the blessing of birkat hagomel when you express thanks to hashem for saving you can somebody else go and represent it on your behalf so right so the whole question is can an adult do it on behalf of a minor that's a lot of question let's say there's a child who's too small to say the birkat hagomel can the adult say it but it's it's problematic because you're saying, thank you, God, for saving me, but it's the other person who was saved. Anyway, this is obviously, we're just touching the surface of the topic. And the verse says, the rivers, these are rivers that flow like our rivers. The canals, these are the man-made pools. Irrigation canals. These are the man-made pools and ditches that were made from man. From the edge of the river to the fields. The waters of the Nile increase. And it rises through the canals and waters the fields. I assume this was prior to the Suez Canal. Yeah. The Suez Canal. Yeah. What? Canals Those canals are still, still there. there. You've Historically, been to... the, 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 the Egyptians... Uh, Get credit for developing the geometry of, of, of the canals and and all the ways of, of uh, yeah all all the historians agree that they were the pioneers. The Egypt, that's how they became the desert. Beautiful. Yeah. So then it says, um, Ag their ponds, Kfutzot Mayim, body of water, Shein and Govim, Bein Moshlin, and Omdim Komecha. They don't spring from the ground or flow; that they stand in one place. Bechol Eretz Mitzrayim. In all the land of Egypt, it became blood. Ah, ah, she says, Even in the bathhouses and in the bathtubs, and all the water that was in vessels and stone vessels, all the water became affected. Everything became affected by this. Everything became affected. Meaning to say, it, when you, you don't even realize what would happen, that the water became, if the water, in America became compromised. Can you imagine what a horrific, like people would be killing each other on the streets within two, 24 hours if the water. That's what they predicted. In, in about 2050, there'll be great wars over water. Shortage. Over water. Oh yeah. Right, we, what happened in Flint? I mean, in, in a matter of, of weeks, like, everybody yeah. wants time. Does Rashi comment on how long like, this particular plague was for the other commentators? Because they the, the other ones that we know, Hoshek was like a certain amount of time. Hoshek was three days. Right, right, exactly. We know the timelines of it. Do we, is there any commentary by Rashi on how long they had to suffer through blood in that situation? So I don't remember. It's a very good question. But um, so Rashi is going to count on it. So uh, Rashi in verse 25 is going to say his answer to that question. If you look ahead, yeah, yeah, yeah. you okay. see that we'll Rashi. get to that. But Rashi basically says seven that the, days, right? uh, the plague would be for seven days, but then the residual effects would last for uh, three weeks or three weeks leading up to it. Yeah, what's the contradiction? Oh, well, maybe they just did it with like somebody's bottled water. <laughs> okay, so, okay. All right, so then verse states, the verse states in the following. 
Okay, what does the verse state? We just do one more pasuk. Okay, well, you know what? We'll we'll uh, let's stop the recording here and we'll pray. Let us pray. Shkoyach to everyone.